Good. All right. My name is Andrew Hay. Uh, I'm the Director of Applied Security Research at Cloud Passage, and this is the Escaping the AppSec Labyrinth talk. Uh, might not be what you're expecting, uh, as you can see from the turnip. So they're losing out. So I, I, I used to be an analyst, an industry analyst at 451. Uh, worked at an information security office in a bank in Western Canada. Or sorry, I have to do that. At a university in Western Canada and at a bank in Bermuda. Uh, I was also a product program and engineering manager at Q1 Labs. So I've been doing a lot of hands-on practical application of security for quite a number of years. And this talk was really born mostly out of the information security office side of things where I was sick of people handing me servers with all of the apps pre-installed and said, all right, you know, put it on the internet, it's ready. Uh, so what this talk is going to do is we're going to go through some of the steps that you can take to actually profile the applications that are on systems and actually know where to start when someone drops something in your lap. And these are the very brief overview of topics that we're going to be talking about. And there will be a tool as well. Chris. <clears throat> so the labyrinth, the story of the labyrinth, and this is probably the best slide in the entire presentation. <laughs> uh, the, the concept of the labyrinth was built by Daedalus to hold the, uh, the Minotaur in Crete. And Daedalus made it so complicated that he almost didn't escape. He actually needed a string to get back out. And so the, uh, the guy on the left is Alex Hutton as Icarus. Also part of a different story, but this was the best picture where I could show Alex half naked. <clears throat> so the way he got out was by following the string, and that's really the clue to escaping the labyrinth. And I couldn't talk about labyrinths without a David Bowie quote. So there's the, the requisite David Bowie reference from the movie Labyrinth. So there's a number of ways to solve a labyrinth, and uh, there's actually a whole bunch of game theory around how to quickly solve labyrinths and mazes just by looking at them and overlaying all sorts of different data on top of them. That's a little bit too complex. So we're gonna talk about, you know, you can blindly walk through the maze, which is really what the security people are forced to do now. You could start from the opposite end, that's only so good when we're talking about application security and great, you can work backwards, but it's still probably gonna take you the same time to get out as if you went from the other end. Uh, there is a known way of walking with one hand on the wall. Eventually you'll get out. It's going to take a very long time to do so, but eventually you should get out of that maze. And uh, then there's having a map, like a turn by turn map to know where you're supposed to be going. That is definitely going to be the quickest way to get through any sort of maze or labyrinth. And well, what's better, you might ask? So of these four, what's the best method? Turn by turn, because it's easy and we're lazy. So I'll, I'll give you another example. So what's better? If you were given a Rubik's Cube and it's put on a table and you were told to solve the Rubik's Cube, you could be given a book on how to solve a Rubik's Cube or you could learn how to solve by doing, by actually picking it up and fumbling around until you figure out the methodology. But what's probably better is having both. So you have the map and the instructions on how to solve the Rubik's Cube and the practical hands-on knowledge to actually go and fiddle around with it to follow those instructions. So this, I'm terming this tactile application security. Um, I don't expect it to have much uptake, but this, you know, nobody, I think has ever said that application security is easy. It's definitely not like riding a bike. It's more like riding a bike like this. <laughs> so why tactile? I could have said tactical, I could have said any number of things, but I wanted to really emphasize that hands-on methodology part because you need to install the software, you need to understand what's going on, you need to look into the packages and the binaries to see what these applications are going to do to the host operating system. And so the definition of tactile, it really does, um, you can reinform your understanding based on book learning, reading, uh, any number of blog posts, anything on the internet, because everything on the internet is true, has to be. Practical knowledge of going through and doing the installation, redoing the installation, finding out what's wrong, 
and then just common sense tactics to go through everything. So this is typically how anyone in an enterprise will deploy an application. So you'll select the platform application framework, you'll deploy it, and then you'll think of maybe securing it. At least this is how it was at some of the bank. Well, definitely at the bank that I worked at. Not so much at the university, but definitely at the bank. And what you get is something like this, a house that's completely in disarray and usually what you know, your SharePoint deployment will look like, even after securing. So how, this is how I propose you deploy applications. You, know, you select the platform, the application, the framework. You deploy it in a test environment. You learn what it's doing from selection to the initial installation. You can then secure it in that test environment and you learn more that way. You can then deploy securely in production, novel concept, I know, and then you monitor it after the fact. So this, this is one of those common sense things, at least to me. Anyone disagree with this? Am I missing any steps? No? Uh, ultimately, we probably should have another arrow that goes from monitoring and, uh, or at least from the last learning back to the selection because this process should influence future selections and future deployments. Kind of a lessons learned type of thing. So it's definitely not impossible and the way to do it is to really interrogate your applications when you're putting them on systems. And this tactile methodology of continuous learning, I propose that you learn by looking at the system and the application before the installation, after the installation, and also during the installation. Uh, you want to know what the application is not just doing when it's sitting there stagnant and running on the system, but also what it's interacting with on the network side of things. So this is the very easy 10,000 foot view. Pre-install, post-install, running, and you get data to actually do stuff with. And uh, because I'm as lazy as everyone else in this room, I actually did write a script to help uh, not necessarily automate the collection of the data, but definitely do some processing with it after the fact. It's the go button. So in terms of pre-install information, who here uses a Red Hat based distribution anywhere? So these are a lot of things that I forgot even existed until I went looking for this talk. So RPM QLP for the package, you can dump that output to a text file and it's going to show you everything that is installed and its location where the default installation will be after installing that package. I thought that's pretty cool. You don't even need to have access to that system. You just need to be able to interrogate the RPM and you now know where to look when you wanna go and start hardening. Uh, and don't feel that you have to furiously write all these down. I've got links to all these at the end of the presentation. Uh, RPM minus Q scripts. So there's a lot of RPMs that will generate uh, init scripts and cleanup scripts after they're installed. And this will allow you to dump just the script to a text file. So you can see what started. Um, there's actually a really good example here. So this is one of the, this is the pre-install script. So it's going to add the, uh, Group 48, Apache, we're going to add a user with no login, and we're going to have the directory as well. So this is very important information. So before it's even handed to you, if Joe Blow admin or Jane Blow admin goes and installs Apache, you know what's, what's going to be installed. Whether they change the permissions of the, uh, the binary or any of the directories, that remains to be seen. Uh, but this gives you, this kind of points you in the direction of where to look, all from inherent tools. Also, check config. Who knows what check config does? Anyone? Configures your startup files. Yeah, yeah. So instead of creating scripts yourself, this is actually adding HTTPD to start. It's pretty cool. A lot easier. Yum. Most people use Yum now instead of RPM. Uh, especially if they're using CentOS, just because it's a lot easier. There is a special util that you can install called yumutils, and then you can run the query, or you can run the uh, executable repo query. And if, so time is the package, you can dump that to a text file, and what it's going to give you is the exact same information as what, uh, back here when we did the RPM QLP for the package, it's going to give you the same thing. The benefit of doing this 
is you don't have to first download the package. This is querying the repository server and giving you the information. So you don't actually have to have that RPM local. Even easier. You're freaking me out that you're writing all this down. <laughs> I'm going too fast, let me know. Or just say go back. Dpackage, if you're using Ubuntu or a Debian-based distribution, dpackage minus L, and I put some grep, some egrep in there. People hate it when I use egrep, but it's just easier to visualize. Uh, and what this is going to do is strip out a lot of the prevailing garbage that this command gives you, and it's going to give you that sample output in the same format as the previous commands. So it's going to give you everything that is going to be installed the directories, paths, file names. Now, unfortunately, apt you can't um, you can't just do like apt get show me or you know apt show me the interior. There's an apt file that you can download, and what it will do is you can interrogate the the package in the repo just like we could with yum, where it's apt file list WordPress. And again, I put some cut in there to get rid of some of the garbage but you're going to get the same format as before, all the directories and all the files. If you're sensing a theme, <laughs> you're on the right track. Now, Windows is a little bit of a pain in general, but in terms of finding where things are in a Windows registry, um, um, you're not, you're not going to find Microsoft documentation that says all of these registry keys are entered and these are all the values for all the keys. You'll find some, and those are usually ones that you can secure through, um, not mom, whatever they turn mom into. And uh, that's it. So you're not gonna know everything. So what you could do is just dump the registry from the command line. So regedit slash capital E registry dot pre. And what that's going to give you is this messy, messy output here, where it's going to show you the key and all the values and their, all the variables and their values. So this is only so good, not easy to really parse through. Um, visually, it's a lot easier to inspect, or you could just do a diff, could get a little messy. I've got a better tool for you. Um, has anyone used malware.com? Anyone do any sort of malware analysis or reverse engineering or anything like that? Who's heard of Cuckoo Sandbox? All right, so malware.com is a freely available front end uh, web service being hosted that has Cuckoo in the back end. So instead of running your own Cuckoo Sandbox server, you can just upload your executables here and it's going to do everything that is done on Cuckoo Sandbox. Uh, it's not entirely reliable. You get what you pay for. It's completely free. So it does kind of go up and down from time to time. I think I've had to create usernames like three or four times since it launched because they keep blowing away the database. Uh, but you can, you'll, you will get registry information, file directory information, what files are dropped and where, and then additional analysis of those files. This is really the lazy person's way to analyze what a Windows binary does. So it, 64 meg max upload, but I'll tell you what it does. So once you upload your executable, and here's the cautionary tale of when you upload it, they store it and they get it. So if you're installing custom applications that were built and are um, the property of your organization or have keys that are already put in there, you're throwing that out into the wild and then they own it. So this will, you'll upload the executable they will launch a, typically I think it's a Windows XP SP3 VM. They'll install it and it's all automated. So it'll go through, it'll click next, 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 take screenshots of the entire process. And then it's going to start analyzing what has actually transpired once this piece of uh, software was executed. So you'll get things like this. Under files, you'll see all the files that were created, dropped, modified. Uh, registry keys, you're gonna see everything that this executable has done. Um, this is actually a piece of malware, so. <laughs> uh, you also get very detailed information under drop files of all of your DLLs, all of your executable batch files, anything that was created. Um, you get hashes. 
you will see if there are any YAR rules that will match that are checking against this. Hopefully your corporate applications that you're installing are not going to match against YAR signatures for malware. If it contacts any sort of domain or has any sort of network connectivity, you will see it here as well. Uh, for the domains hosts, any HTTP requests, interactions, IRC, SMTP, again, hopefully doesn't interact with IRC or any of these really, other than domains and hosts. Uh, <clears throat> there's also behavioral analysis where it's going to monitor what's happened from the point if you were double clicking on the executable and running through the process, it's going to show every step of the way what was edited. So you'll, it's almost like running an executable in a debugger where you're setting breakpoints along the way. This is just capturing almost every breakpoint as we go. Another easy way to do it on your own system or in a VM is to use RedShot. Free to download. What it's going to do is record what happens on the Windows system as soon as you double click the executable. It's going to record all of your files directories, registry key values, uh, any additions, changes, deletions, if it cleans things up after the fact, it's all going to be recorded. Available on SourceForge. Very cool. Users on a Unix system, you know, this is pretty, pretty common information. Uh, I just added some cuts in there to actually get us that list in a nice clean format. So shadow for users. Uh, on Windows, I did upload a PowerShell script to GitHub that will allow you just to run get local user, and it's gonna give you the exact same information and the same output where it lists top-down administrator through all your local users. Because again, I'm lazy like you guys. User group mappings, again, Etsy group with some cut. You're getting all the information. I probably should have cleaned up the, uh, the semicolon, but man, you get what you pay for. Uh, I also uploaded a PowerShell script for getting the group. Uh, this is going to give you all of the user groups on Windows system. Startup scripts. This is my very lazy way of running fine to show all of the executables in uh, initd and uh, dumps it all to the file, same format. You may or may not care about this. Personally, I'd like to see what's created and what's going to start up once I reboot the system. Windows, didn't have to write anything for this, although I guess I could have made it easier, but the get WI, WMI object, Win32 service, that has all of your startup script information, information, whether it's a manual, automatic, or disabled. So if you do this before, then install a Windows application, run this again, then you'll be able to see what has been changed. If it turns on printer, uh, the, so back 10 years ago, a lot of applications would say, okay, well, they're always gonna have the printer daemon running, so I need that to be running, otherwise I'm not gonna be able to start. That's what they'd use to hook into. And uh, I actually worked at a company that did that. And when you're talking about servers, you probably don't need the printing daemon running all the time. So uh, a lot of applications fail. So if you see things being turned on by the application, that look odd to you, question it. Now more of the file system. You could obviously exclude a lot more than I have here, but for the sake of brevity, I've just gotten rid of proc because proc's always going to change. Uh, and this is really, this is as ghetto of file integrity monitoring as you're going to find. So if you wanted to do this in a cron job, go for it. Uh, probably not the best thing. And find also works on Windows, so find star, your directory, dump it out. System, so this is a lot of information to do manually. I'm sure you agree. Uh, services on Linux host, netstat, with those flags, dump it. Running services on Windows, get service where the object is running, where the status is running, dump that out as well. Any questions about phase one? <laughs> yes. Why not use NetStack and Windows as well? Is it I could. There, there's a lot of overlap in a lot of the Windows uh, services. I wanted to give people things that could easily be scripted later without having to go outside of PowerShell or the WMI. Like a lot of the WMI commands you could just call remotely. Mm -hmm. 
uh, which could be easier if you're doing just kind of centralized monitoring with distributed hosts. Uh, there's, there's really no right or wrong way to get service or any sort of information out of a Windows system or a Linux system. And the problem is that there's so many, like I could have put VB scripts up to get information out of uh, the different APIs in Windows, but I haven't done VB in 10 years and that's how I like it. Any other questions about phase one? Like I'm sure there's other things that I'm missing. By all means, if, if you don't want to say anything now, come find me after. I'd love to add to this list because I think this is great for someone coming into an operations group like, oh, you know, if you gave the security person all of this information, then they're not going to hate you after you give them the server. The comment about people that use OS 10 for whatever reason, um, usually during an install, you can hit Command I or Command L. It gives you a log of what's going to be installed or where it's going to be installed. Oh, very cool. So very simple. Yeah, so Command I or Command L on OS X? Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, this has been uh, primarily created for Linux and Windows, but I should probably extend it because there's a lot more people using Max for servers. Like you said, for whatever reason. So during the install, process monitor. Has anyone used process monitor on Windows before? Yep. It's a great and very, very noisy tool. Um, <laughs> Unless you set your filters, you can really turn this into an installation watcher. So you can have it watch, you can set it just to monitor for your file name, uh, you know, installer.exe, and it's going to show you everything that happens on the system in relation to installer.exe. Wireshark, obviously, if you want to start monitoring what's happening on the network, be alarmed if you start seeing outbound requests when you don't expect outbound requests. Same thing, TCP dump, going to work on Windows and Linux, uh, same as Wireshark. I tend to stick to Wireshark or T-Shark on Windows, I don't know why, just personal preference. And then TCP dump on any sort of Linux distribution just because nine times out of ten it's there. And again, install watcher. So any questions, anything missing from uh, while things are being installed? I seriously considered about using um, S-Trace on doing installation, but I think you'd have to like be able to read the matrix just by looking at things if you're going to start doing that. That's a lot of information to try and process and cull through. It would be too much, but it sure would be fun. Fun, yeah. <laughs> I guess if you've got the time, by all means do it, but that's, that, that's quite the exercise. In, uh, Oh yeah, you, you get so much information from running S-Trace and then the executable. So post-install. I don't know how many of you know this, but in varlib dpackage info, you're going to see all of these scripts and installation information uh, for application. So pre-install, it's going to show you everything that's going to be run for the installation post-install, any cleanup it does. Uh, post RM when it starts removing things, what process it goes through. It's going to give you the actual MD5 sums of the files, which is you know kind of kind of useful to have, uh, and a list of all the files and directories created by the installation. So a lot of your work is done for you here, but you first have to install it to get to this point. So I could see this being very valuable if you were doing this in a test environment. You're going to know exactly what's going to be created for that particular uh, Debian package version, and you're going to get the MD5 sums. If the MD5 sums differ on the different systems, well, then that is a little suspect. You might want to see if you're running a different version than they are, or install a different version, or if uh, different, <clears throat> different files are created in different directories. That's a little worrisome to me. Then, this is, again, post Unix. Uh, these are all of the commands that we talked about in the pre Unix Linux information gathering, and uh, I've just put them in the order that, actually seemingly random order, because this isn't the order we covered them in. But this is all information you could just dump to the file. Uh, typically I put either a dot pre for the beginning and then dot post for the aftermath, and uh, that way I can dip them a lot easier and keep them kind of sorted in my head. And again with the windows, all the same commands. So back to Redshot. So Redshot 
actually, once you run it, there's a little button right over here called compare, and it's the O character. And what it's going to do after you do the second shot is it's going to show you everything that's different from, or everything that's newly created from the first snapshot. So this is doing the diff for you, and it's only showing you the diff. This is what's been created. So it's going to tell you the files that were added, the directories that were added, the registry keys that were added. Pretty simple, pretty lightweight. Now, there are some, this is a, shell, a PowerShell script that I uploaded. It's going to give you network statistics <coughs> as you're running your systems, or sorry, as you're running your applications, and it gives a very detailed output where you're getting the protocol, the address, the port, the remote that it's interacting with. Uh, again, you can get this from Netstat, but this goes a little bit further and gives you the, the PID and the process name and everything. This is, it's just an easier way to digest what you're seeing. And again, Wireshark TCP dump, uh, once it's running, I would definitely recommend, if you're going to install an application in a lab, I would leave this, leave your dump running because maybe it's got a wait timer. Maybe it's not going to start communicating out for 15, 20 minutes, two days. It all depends how it's created, right? So you probably want to see, leave it running for a week in a VM, see what happens. See if it starts interacting with the network. Now, this, this is a really, this is probably the first Ruby script I ever wrote. So if you look at it and are, want to rip your eyes out, I completely understand. Uh, I am not a developer. But what this does is it will start enumerating your root file system and tell you the counts of all the files in those directories. So this is good if you want to know um, what's being created or the, the counts that are differing between pre and post install. Uh, then you can do a diff of this information as well. It's only so valuable. It becomes more valuable when you want to start doing like file integrity monitoring because very few people will say, okay, I'm going to do FIM on root and everything and recursive through everything because you're going to get screwed on proc and, and some of the other things. You know? So this is, this is just kind of like a handy thing to, to get a count of everything. So now that you have all the information, what do you do with it? Uh, you could just tuck it away for reference later on. You can manually aggregate all the data to figure things out, which is you know, ideally what you should be doing now with this kind of stuff to understand what's going on. Or you could use a tool that'll take things a little bit further. Um, and now I'm gonna tell you about the tac tactile file profiler, uh, which is much harder to say when you're drunk <laughs> than I realized initially. So uh, we're gonna call it TFP. Pardon me? Tactifiler. Tactifiler. It sounds kind of funny too. Something, something Sharknado. All right. <laughs> so this is really, you know, I would call this pre-alpha. It works for some of the stuff. Uh, what it is going to do is it's going to take the input of your pre and your post. It's going to do a diff for you and allow you to, it's going to take all your file permit, all your file locations and get the permissions, ownership, uh, SGID, SUID, um, for directories, it's going to do the same for ownership and permissions. So it, right now, it's just doing the file system permissions on Windows, or file system permissions and ownership on Windows and Linux, which was a good place to start. So uh, the caveat, it's very poorly written in Ruby, a little bit better than the, uh, the other one that I wrote, but uh, it is multi-platform. And you can get it at uh, my GitHub repo. So yeah, takes two inputs, uh, recursive find of the directory. I've already been over that. So it's really easy. You know, Ruby TFB, the first, the pre-file and the post-file. And uh, from there, you get something that looks like this. I know this probably isn't the easiest thing to see, but this is actually a tool that I use internally at Cloud Passage when I'm defining rules. Uh, because it makes it a lot easier when I'm trying to figure out file integrity monitoring or um, configuration security monitoring rules. So what you have is, it's always going to be active. Uh, the element, what it's going to be, so in this case, Etsy, WordPress, WV config PHP, whether it's a file or a directory, it knows to calculate or to figure that out. 
uh, a description, that is null. Uh, file presence, should we do a file presence check on this? Yes, it's a file. You can decide later on if you don't want to do that or not. Uh, it's going to dump out the ACL of the file, the owner, the group owner. Uh, if it has set UID or set GID set, if it's a directory, it'll have the directory ACL, as you can see down here. Uh, and, you know, is it going to have sticky bit set? These, these ones here at the end are things that I'm going to be adding through the interrogation of the files. So, you know, what, uh, what interface is it listening on? What, what process should own it? So that's kind of coming later. Oh, and I forgot I highlighted everything. <laughs> so here's the map. So file ownership, file group, purple. Directory ACL 755, directory ownership, directory group ownership, 00, zero so root. So what you can do is you can take all this information and because it's in tab delimited format, because I think people that do CSV should die in a fire for parsing, that's horrible. Tab delimited is going to be a lot easier. So you just import it, and it's going to give you all this information in this nice format. Obviously, on the bottom, all the nulls aren't that great. Depends on the file. As I add more features and functionality to it, that'll get a little bit more full. So the next version of that particular tool, uh, I, I really want to create an exclusion list, because do you really care what image files are created or other sort of temporary files that are going to be cleaned up after. You don't really need to look at that. Um, I'm going to have more command line switch support because right now you can only, f it'll take two inputs and that's it. Uh, you could probably try and do three. I don't know if it's going to take the first two or the last two or the first and the third. It's Ruby. It's magic. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm going to actually have it kick off uh, some sort of packet sniffing and then feed that information back in to the tool for better analysis. And uh, like I was saying, for the, the last section of the, of the output, I want to see you know, the profiling of the service, whether it's running, listening ports, ownership of that process, and, uh, and just you know, profile service-related information, which I think would be valuable. Uh, and I also want to generate all of those profiling files that we talked about initially with just a handy command line switch where you're not going and running everything top down by yourself. You would do like, you know, TFP dash dash pre and it would generate all the files and then TFP dash dash post and it would generate all the files and then maybe TFP dash examine and it would take the two and and merge them together and give you all the information. Because I, I want to make this easier, because not a lot of people do this. Uh, so I had no idea how long this was going to take, <clears throat> because I had so many slides. But uh, so you know what I'm, what I'm doing now. And are there any, any questions about the methodology I've employed? Can anyone see themselves? Does this look too complicated to do right now, manually? Or are you going to wait for me to do the tool for you? <laughs> yes? Just a question, clarification on objectives here. You're primarily focusing on system integrity here. So you're deploying an application there, and you're looking for the inputs to determine pre and post installation state to monitor that standard going forward. Is that that, that's one use case. So <clears throat> the question was, uh, was this primarily for file monitoring or integrity monitoring? Uh, yes and no. I could see it being used as a way to really document what the application is. So if you're doing an incident response or forensic analysis exercise, you're nine times out of 10, you're given a, a, either a hard drive or a computer is just put on your desk. It's like, go forensicate this, which is fun. Um, at least if you know where to start. So if they can say, oh, well, you know, from the logs, we think uh, that the web app was popped. So, okay, well now we know what application uh, was potentially compromised. So we can look through the, the post or the gold status state. We can now run the file against the current file system and see if anything pops up. So this is something that could help focus an investigator on an incident. 
but also if you're bringing in interns that you're telling, okay, go install these applications, you know what the expected outcome is before they've even started. And if they have questions, you can say, well, you know, based on our documentation, we have, you know, this should be set to this. And you could also verify uh, file ownership. So just because it's given to you with 644 on all the directories and files, doesn't mean that that's the most secure state, or if it's the web server is owned by the default uh, www data. That's great, but maybe you don't want to do that. Uh, you'll probably still want to like put uh, put your web server in a rooted jail, and you know just do extra things. But the, the primary purpose of this was to give people something to reference down the road. Uh, I know when I was building servers, I would forget. Like just like when I'm developing these scripts, I had to go through the, uh, not the TFP, but the other one, and read through it like, so that's what that does again, all right. I'm trying to think of what it did. And it's the same thing with deploying application servers, um, especially in academia. Anyone here work at a university or has ever worked in a university? Very rigorous documentation procedures, nothing changes all the time, everything's a gold standard <laughs> image. It's all, yeah, yeah. pristine. <laughs> Never the case, never the case. So this gives a little bit of extra ammunition to figuring out what your applications are doing on the system. Any other questions? Yes? So you, you, I'm trying to put this into a context for like a big enterprise company or something, right? And I'm also wondering about, can you talk a little more of the context of where, of how you're using it in cloud passes? And uh, what sort of, I guess, business, stream business capability is Okay, uh, so yeah, how, how are we using this in Cloud Passage and what are we using it for? Yeah, so I, how do you sell your management on, the, on that work? Well, this was the kind of thing where I did in my free time while my wife was watching Dancing with the Stars and I could tune that out. Yeah. And uh, then I just kind of presented it to them as a way to make the policy definitions for our product, which allows you to do FIM rules, uh, configuration monitoring, file location information. I wanted a way that I could do this profiling, hand, hand that spreadsheet off to the analyst and say, okay, go build the policy and feed it back into the product. So it, it was really taking a lot of manual effort out of it for me because I've got to do that. And apparently, you know, what I do also is marketing and you know, sales over here and startup, you wear like every hat on the rack. So it, this was just a way to make my job easier and I thought it would be helpful and you know, could be used to help other people. Like if I had this when I was at the university, this would have made so much sense for me to have just you know, filed for every application that was out there instead of like, oh yeah, we installed this uh, six years ago, we're not sure what it does. Uh, something horrible happened. We, we think one of these 10 servers has child exploitation images on it. Go, come on, <laughs> that's not easy. Thanks. Well, then it was worth it. And I didn't have to watch Dancing with the Stars, so it's a, it's a two for <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So just, just to summarize, you, know, you can navigate this application and system landscape if you know where to go. And hopefully I've shown you how to generate that map yourself. Obviously, I'd say 99% of you are going to wait until I make the tool just like with a big red go button. So that you don't have to do, yeah. <laughs> so you don't have to do all this pre-work. It is a lot of pre-work, but you can script it all. And then you're probably saying, well, you could script it all too, and then we could just execute the script. But you're not a developer. So but I'm not a developer, and it's going to be in Ruby, not in Python, because I don't care. <laughs> yes? So you are developing the uh, TFP on, on GitHub, right? Yes, yeah. So technically, we can also assist you, right? You can fork it and make it better. Awesome. Make it gooder. <laughs> and you, just have, you can't make fun of my code because it's really bad. It's not like awful at go tos or anything, but it's damn close. <clears throat> so it, it's easy to get the information about your applications. Right now, you just have to take that manual effort and do it. Um, or again, wait for me to do it for you. And we really need to stop. I, I, I could see this tool. You could give this to your ops people or your DevOps people and say, hey, you know what, just run this script and give me the output, email it to me, I don't care. 
and then once everything's done, run this script and email it to me. That's all I'm asking you for, just an email. Now you know what's going on. When they drop it on your desk, you will have a plan in place of like, oh yeah, well, like all these permissions are wrong and the ownership's wrong, so I know what to go in. You're not going in blind. And please, we really need to stop putting out unconfigured, unsecured servers out on the internet. Obviously, it keeps the security vendors in business, but it's just not a very good practice to follow. Uh, so the, all the tools are on these slides, um, especially the malware.com, very cool to check it out if you haven't checked it out before. It'll make your life a whole lot easier, and it's kind of fun to see what malware does when you upload it there too. Redshot, also very cool. Uh, Tactical File Profiler is there, and then the PowerShell scripts that, you know, I probably stole them from somewhere, because I didn't write them, I just cannot attribute them to who I stole them from. So, uh, don't say, oh yeah, Andrew wrote this. Andrew copied this from somewhere and put it available for someone else to download. So I, I care. I'm gonna say it was a news group. Uh, process Monitor, you get it from Sys Internals. Uh, process Monitor actually used to be split out into Regmon and something else, and I can't remember what it was, but then they kind of merged them. Wow, yeah, that's right, but they merged them. Uh, Wireshark, TCP Dump, you probably have those already. So thank you, if there's any questions, please, yes? Can you script the process of sending the email? <laughs> yeah, well, I'll do a cron job just for you, buddy, no problem. Yeah, he asked if we could script the, uh, the email. Problem, yeah. You know what, if you, if you made it part of your build process, I think that'd be great. Document, you know, I will not accept this as being built until this email gets sent out with this <laughs> file output and get someone with a, a V in front of their title to, to sign off on it. I think that'd be great. Good luck. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> if you work in academia, never happen. <laughs> They'll throw that whole academic freedom card at you. You'll never see it again. All right, well, if there's no more questions, uh, I'm around all day today and tomorrow. Grab me, say hello. I thought you get uh, 10 minutes back.